this video, we're going to talk about seafloor spreading. Okay. Before that, let's review some concepts, such as the continental drift theory. This is introduced by Alfred Wegener in 1915 in his book, The Origin of Continents and Oceans. So in the early days, geologic phenomena such as earthquakes and volcanic explosions were thought to be caused by supernatural forces. It was thought that the planet was formed the way it is. Oh my God! Wegener proposed that long ago in the geologic past, the continents formed a single landmass called Pangaea. Okay. This Pangaea broke into several continents and drifted to their current positions. So Wegener cited some evidence of continental drift theory. First is the fit of the continental short lines. So Wegener viewed the apparent fit of the continents along their coastline as pieces of jigsaw puzzles. He said that this is an indication that the continents were once joined together. So for example, coast of Africa fits well the eastern coast of South America. Next is the matching of rock units across ocean basins. He used the locations of sediments and rocks. He also stated the distribution of fossils. So again, fossils are remnants of organisms preserved in a rock that are indicative of marine and terrestrial organisms. He said that there are fossils of the same organism in certain places in several continents. Lastly, we have the paleoclimate evidence. He says that this is an evidence of tropical climates and past glaciations. However, many scientists rejected Wegener's continental drift. What? That is shocking! Simply because Wegener could not conceive of an acceptable mechanism for moving the continents around. Okay, so there's no mechanism of action or there's no force. However, remember that these arguments for continental drift theory can also be evidences to support seafloor spreading. Okay, so like this. So the continents were once joined but now separated. This implies that something had to put between the continents for them to move apart. And what is that? Yes, the seafloor. My God! Yo! There are observations and evidences that led to the hypothesis of seafloor spreading. First is the distribution of seafloor topographic features. This is the distribution of mid-ocean ridges and depth of the seafloor. Next, we have the sediment thickness. Fine layer of sediment covering much of the seafloor becomes progressively thicker away from the mid-ocean axis. Means that seafloor sediment is not as thick as previously thought. Next, we have the composition of oceanic crust. Researchers noticed that the oceanic crust is primarily consists of basalt rocks. Another observation is that there is high heat flow along the mid-ocean ridge axis. This led scientists to speculate that magma is rising into the crust just below the mid-ocean ridge axis. Now, if you remember our discussion, you will have an idea if this is true or not. I remember... Ugh. Next, we also have distribution of submarine earthquakes. Earthquakes do not occur randomly but occurs in defined distinct belts. Earthquake belts follow trenches, mid-oceanic ridges, and transform faults. In 1960, Harry Ress introduced the theory of seafloor spreading. He proposed that seafloor separates at mid-ocean ridges where new crust forms by upwelling magma. Now, newly formed oceanic crust moves laterally away from the ridge with a motion like that of a conveyor belt. This is best described by this GIF. Okay, so remember, old oceanic crusts are dragged down at the trenches and reincorporated back into the mantle. So this will form new crust. This process is driven by mantle convection. Currents rise at the ridges and descend at the trenches. We have discussed this before. Now this idea is basically the same as that proposed 
by Arthur Holmes in 1920. Uh, Arthur Holmes, like Sherlock Holmes? Maybe, we do not know. What are the proofs of seafloor spreading? First is the magnetic stripes on the seafloor. Detailed mapping of magnetism recorded in rocks shows that these rocks recorded reversals in direction and strength of the Earth's magnetic field. So as you can see, there is up and down in the graph here. So the red and the blue ones. So it will go down, then it will go up, down, and up. So that's reversal. Listen, look, and listen, and learn. <laughs> Again, alternating high and low magnetic anomalies run parallel to mid-ocean ridges. Pattern of magnetic anomalies also matches the pattern of magnetic reversal, already known from studies of continental lava flows. Next, we have the deep sea drilling results, like this. So the age of seafloor forms a symmetric pattern across the mid-oceanic ridges. So age of seafloor increases with the distance from the oceanic ridge. So take note, no seafloor older than 200 million years could be found. It indicates that seafloor is constantly being created and destroyed. There is science and scientific proof. Based on this, we can debunk many misconceptions. First, the seafloor is the same age as the continents. It's not true. The entire seafloor is the same age. It's not also true because again, age increases with the distance from the oceanic ridge. So the farther to the oceanic ridge, the older it is. She's got a point. Last misconception is the Earth is expanding. Some people say that seafloor is created but never destroyed. So, no, right? So remember the mantle convection. That's, that's what happens. Now, what is the theory of plate tectonics? The main principle of plate tectonics is that the Earth's outermost rigid layer, or the lithosphere, is broken into discrete plates each moving more as a unit. Remember, we have also said that plate tectonics is driven by mantle convection. Different types of relative motion and different types of lithosphere at plate boundaries create the distinctive sets of geologic features, like mountains and volcanoes and etc. So let's talk about the lithospheric plates. The lithosphere consists of the crust and the uppermost mantle. The average thickness of continental lithosphere is 150 kilometers, and the average thickness of old oceanic lithosphere is 100 kilometers. So the composition affects their respective densities. The lithosphere floats on a soft plastic layer called the asthenosphere. So remember, most plates contain both oceanic and continental crust, but some of them, a few of them, contain only oceanic crust. And the most important thing that you need to remember is that a plate is not the same as a continent. Okay, so another misconception. The continent is on top of a layer of water that is above a plate. Now this slide shows you the types of plate boundaries. We have the divergent, convergent, and transform. In the divergent, you have oceanic, oceanic, continental, continental. In convergent, oceanic, continental, Oceanic, oceanic, and continental, continental. Another concept that you need to know is the Wilson cycle. Basically says that plate tectonics is cyclic. So in 1966, J. Tuzo Wilson proposed a cycle that includes continental breakup, drifting, collision, and reassembly of the continent. So see, continents do break up like humans. Are you not ashamed of yourself? Are you not embarrassed? This is really embarrassing. This best summarizes the Wilson cycle. First, you have drifting. This leads to opening of new ocean basin and formation of oceanic crust. Next, we have drifting. So passive margin cools and sinks. Here, sediment accumulates along the edge. Third is the subduction. In here, convergence begins. This initiates subduction and eventual ocean closure. Lastly, we have the collision. Continent-continent collision occurs here. 
this forms the next supercontinent. And then the cycle continues. So what allows plates to move? The answer is the convection in the mantle. Now there are two types of convection, the slab pull and ridge push. So the slab pull develops when cold, then subducting slab of lithosphere pulls along the rest of the plate behind it. The ridge push develops as gravity pushes the lithosphere off the mid-ocean ridges and toward the subduction trenches. So just remember that these two are gravity-driven mechanisms. Uh, I guess. <laughs>